Lord, thank you, Lord, for the physical workout. Got to work out with friends, hanging out, and being able to move our bodies, Lord. What a blessing to be able to have the opportunity to move. And so, Lord, we just pray as we get into your word that you continue to um, share with us those things that uh, you're pressing upon our hearts and those things to uh, put into action, Lord, whatever that may be. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so gymnastics, we're on the pyramid going up on the fitness side. What does gymnastics have to do with anything on the, in God's word? Well, some of the basic movements of we do in gymnastics, push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups, air squats, is basic things that sometimes we skip over because mm, we want to do the shiny things. We want to back squat. We want to press. We want to do these things. Maybe we see on YouTube or see other people doing that are getting stronger. But to build a foundation, we need to have this basic piece of body weight, which is weighted and making sure we are moving through in good form. And so you can always rely on basics in life, right, Destiny? The basics in life create us not getting straight away by people giving us false things out there physically, uh, more importantly, spiritually, right? Right now, uh, nothing new when there's a sun where we see that there's a lot of false things going on. Churches, people, we're being deceived. Government, our country, we thought it would just be all these other countries that are uh, being deceived. And we are the free country, not us. No way we will be deceived. We're free in God we trust and everything. We take it for granted. And now, where are we at right now? God's hand slowly being lifted, you know, because we're not following the... the the Lord from the top down. And so we see our country, but then we see households from the top down. And then you see inside whoever is following you from the top down. God is instructing us, giving us stewardship over people, over th those ministries in our lives. And we all have a ministry what God is instructing us to do. And so I, I love gymnastic, the piece on the fitness side, because it it so relates to our spiritual walk, you know, and, and it sounds like a broken record, like, yeah, we know these things, yeah. But it's, it's always better to sometimes, well, I think a lot of times, to be reminded than to be taught new things. God just reminds us and reminds us and reminds us and reminds us. No different than the Israelites being reminded, 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 40 years in the wilderness hanging out, and hey, you could have got there in 12 miles, but here you go. So some of our journeys can seem like 40, 80, you know, just speaking to myself, like, well, Lord, I'm sorry, maybe, hopefully I can get it this time. And so we always have these trials, this adversity, but God's growing us. He's growing us through all of this stuff that we all go through. It means different in all of our lives. And so when we just look at your physical walk, uh, those who have been here time, a long time, and maybe those who've been here maybe a month, and we can encourage those who've been here a month or a day or a week. And what we can say is, hey, it's, it doesn't really get easier. <laughs> You're just being more aware of the, the simple things. And then you have to just be more consistent as you add these other healthier habits and behaviors into your life. Because here's what the world wants to do. They want to do everything. Like here comes New Year's resolution. They're ready to do it January 1st. Well, you're too late. You have to prepare today. Because as we build this structure, here comes January. Now we're ready to reset a new goal, a new plan. It's only three, four months away. But we come back to the basics of understanding. What does that look like in our life? So practice the basics, not just remember the basics, because we remember a lot of things. But as you practice, you're actually doing these things, right? When you do these things, you don't have to remember, you don't have to tell no one, because they learn by watching you, even when you think they're not watching you. And so Paul's telling Timothy this exact thing. Remember, go back. You've seen me in all these trials, the suffering, shipwreck. You've seen all these things. You, you know the stories. You witness all these things. And now, here's your time. You've seen how I church planted. You've seen how I, uh, re how I built relationships. You've seen how they came against me and all these other cities and how they 
they, they kicked me out and they stoned me and, and I kept on saying to live, as, to live as Christ and to die is gain. You know, in Philippians he says this. And that's it's so true because like knowing what our end goal is, is it just for instant gratification today? Is it just for uh, appearance from the outside in? You know, our, our vision statement here is from the inside out. And so what does that look like in our life uh, today? And so we're going to take a look at 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 17. But I want to read the beginning and just give us a backdrop here of verse uh, 1 through maybe 5 or so. But he's, uh, Paul's talking about the perilous times, perilous men. He says, but, but know this in verse 1. Then in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. And so we see the same thing going on right here in our day-to-day -day action. And so and he's, he's, he's just rem reminding Timothy, reminding Timothy, remember these things, remember these things, these people. And we see that in our surroundings right now today. And there's a, there a farming community that it hadn't rained in a long time. And things were getting desperate. The, the minister decided they were going to call a prayer meeting. And they said, look, we want the whole town to come to the prayer meeting and bring their religious symbols, he said. So the whole town showed up for the prayer meeting. The people brought crosses. They brought their Bibles. The Catholics brought their rosaries. They all cried out to God. They finished the prayer meeting. No rain was in sight. No rain at all. They all went home. The next day, though, in the town square where, where they had the meeting, there was a little boy, and he prayed, Oh, God, we need rain. God, show the power and give us rain. The day before, with all the preachers and the religious symbols, calling on God and no rain, the little boy shows up next day by himself in the town square, and he was praying. The sky got darker as he was praying. Rumbling occurred as he was praying. The showers hit, and it was pouring down rain. What was it about the little boy? He said the same things that all the people said the day before. The day before, they had all the preachers. They had all the ministers. They even brought the, the religious symbols. But the day the young boy came, when the clouds got dark, he lifted up the symbol that he brought. He brought the umbrella. He expected it to rain. When you anticipate rain, you take an umbrella. When a man tells you, it's going to rain when the meteorologist says it's going to storm today. Most people will get the umbrellas because they believe his word. Meteorologists are wrong half the time. Maybe not half the time, but, and we still take them for their word, right? Why is it when it comes to God, who is never wrong, we hesitate to believe and act on his word. We hesitate. He tells us. He reminds us. And we're not prepared. But meteorologists tell us, and we're like, Ron, tell everyone. Here comes the storm, Hillary, or whatever is coming next. And sometimes they're right. We have to be prepared. Can't be, you know, we got to be wise. But here Paul is instructing Timothy. He's on his last leg. We got Nero is the emperor here. And there's a passion, what he's writing to his dear friend, Timothy. And so as we pick it up in verse 10, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're in verse 10. And it says, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, and perseverance. So after strongly crushing the false teachers, Paul, and their foolishness, Paul turned to his attention back to Timothy, who could look at Paul as an example of living out the opposite characteristics of those described in, which I just read, verses 2 through 9. Remember he said, lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters and proud people. 
Paul's now saying, Timothy, you've carefully followed me and watched me in these areas. He followed close by his side. He's seen the long suffering, the patience that Paul had. When God has given you a purpose, a vision, we're not to quit. We're to persevere knowing that there will be trials. There will be things that will come our way. In verse 11, it says, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. The afflictions, if one suffers, has suffered. We ever have things, afflictions in our life. Many of us, we have afflictions at times, right? Many shapes and sizes, depending on where we're at in life. And he says, which happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. It was on Paul's first ministry journey with Barnabas that, that faced persecution at these cities in Asia Minor. Iconium was about 70 miles south of Antioch. Lystra is about 20 miles further south of Iconium. And in Acts chapter 13, in Antioch, Paul reads, uh, we read that Paul is being used to preach to the multitudes in the city of Antioch. But some of the unbeliever Jews became envious of Paul's popularity, and they had him run out of town, right? Continue, that was kind of Paul's MO, he's run out of town, run out of town. In Iconium, Acts chapter 14, we read Paul moving south to Iconium, and where Paul was again threatened by unbelieving Jews. They threatened to stone him. And then he left the town. And then in Lystra, Acts chapter 14, we read in verse 19, it says, Then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. This was Paul, this was uh, Timothy's hometown. But Timothy was just a kid at the time. He wasn't yet acquainted with Paul. We see that this was the first time that Timothy and his family became kind of exposed to Paul. But it won't be until chapter uh, verse six, I mean, sorry, chapter 16 of Acts that Paul meets young Timothy in Lystra on the second missionary journey with Silas. And then Timothy would join Paul becoming his disciple. But, but it seems that Paul's example to Timothy may have started back in Acts 16. And the end of ver verse 11 says, What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. It is a blessing to endure those heavy loads that are placed on our shoulders and watching the Lord holding us up to the finish line. Like he holds us up. Those things, those heavy things that are pressed upon us in life. When have you seen the Lord hold you up through a difficult season? We could probably just, there's many times in our life, in our stories, our testimony, we can see And we may be aware, you may be aware that the others are watching your life. We usually hope that they will see all the good things happening to us and watching us being blessed by God. But I think they, they really catch the eye of others who, who may be watching us, not how blessed you can be, but how you handle the tough times. The persecution, the suffering, the trials. I would think that how you handle the tough times will be the greatest thing or the greatest impact on others. And ask yourself the, this question, will I demonstrate long-suffering, love, perseverance, even when I'm in the fire? Would I be able to show that? Even in the fire. Verse 12, it says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Now, 
we have this idea that if, if we want to live in a way that pleases God, that life ought to be better and easier. But it seems that in reality, sometimes just the opposite is true. Living for Christ, following Christ. It's all how, what lens you look at it at, through. Others may see, well, they're suffering pretty bad. But if God is for you, who could be against you? If he's instructing you to do something and it may seem like it's not working out on the outside, but you're being obedient to what God is calling you to do, it's not suffering at all. You're continuing to do what he instructs us to do. There's a story in the Gospel for Asia's website. It's called Flying Stones, West of Bengal. And it says, it was late at night. And a native missionary, Rinzin, was all alone walking home from a nearby village on his new uh, mission field in West Bengal. Suddenly, stones flew all around him. He desperately ran for cover, not sure from what direction the attack came. Shaken up but un unharmed, he reached his small rented room on the outskirts of the tea plantation. Born in Butin, Rinzin was no stranger to persecution. Right after accepting Christ as a youth, he was banned from attending school. Shortly after, he had led his entire family to Jesus. They all were excommunicated from their village. Later on, when the Lord called him to full-time ministry, Rinzen attended GFA's Missionary Training Center in Nepal. After his graduation, April 1997, he was sent out to West Bengal to work among the poor and the most illiterate laborers on the tea estate. Most of the plantation workers are either idol worshipers from Nepal. These groups practice witchcraft. They do not like Christianity as a foreign religion and ostracizes anyone from their community who accepts Christ. Flying stones were only the beginning. Rinzen had to endure countless trials, opposition, threats, beatings, but he never considered leaving his mission field. Instead, he prayed a great deal and entrusted the Lord who called him. God began to open doors for him. A man suffering from tuberculosis, tuberculosis was instantly healed when Rinzen prayed over him. Others were likewise freed from demon possession or healed from sickness. When he called upon the mighty name of Jesus on their behalf, people began to come to Jesus. As a number of believers grew, GFA sent two Bible women graduates from uh, Butin Training Center to help Renzen and his wife with the outreach work. In the meantime, the church had grown to 50 members and presently a new church building is under construction. The persecution hasn't stopped. But now in the midst of darkness, the light of the gospel is shining brightly. When we make a decision, when we, you make a decision to serve the Lord, don't be surprised when you have a bad week. Expect it. The enemy will try to, his hardest to, his, to scourge you at anything thrown your way hey, take, as you take your stand for Jesus. So expect it. In verse 13, it says, but even men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Don't be discouraged when you see evil people prospering. We see it right now. It'll even get worse. I just watched the, uh, one of our members uh, told us about, uh, it's a series, Painkillers, about yeah, um, I usually don't watch like series, but yeah, yeah, watch you gotta watch it, and then you know you watch one, and all of a sudden you watch six. It was on oxycotton, but oh my goodness, you don't know all the stuff behind. Like, why are they these guys getting rich and killing? I mean, it was all a, just a scam, and the FDA and how they. I mean, so this right along with the billions. I mean, thirty million a week was his minimum of making. I mean, so this was like nothing new under the sun. That was going on back then. 
today and forever. And so you see that this is the wonder drug. It's going to get all pain relief, you know. And so once you're on it, you can't get off it. It's heroin, <laughs> you know. And so just disguised with this marketing scheme and the wrapper and how it's the FDA approved for it, so it must be good. And so, so we see how many other things must be good. Go ahead and go do it, and you'll be cured of all these things. And so more is to come. More is to come, being aware, being on guard, having your walking circumspectly, head on a swivel, knowing God's word will help, being, not being deceived. In verse 14, it says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them. Continue in what you have learned and what you have been assured of. Paul isn't saying learn more, dig deeper. No, he's telling Timothy to stay away from false spirituality. Stick with the basics. The word translated whom being plural, Paul most likely is alluding to Timothy's mother, grandmother, as those who, in addition to himself, had spiritually impacted uh, Timothy's life. They, they mentored him. He, they were there for him. And I'm always skeptical when, when someone says, you know, I, I only learn from this guy, or I only follow that man. You know, wise is the man or woman who will learn from many people the Lord places in their lives or reinforce, reinforces or strengthens their faith, right? We have many people that, that pour into us, or we may pour into others, right? But being wise, knowing God's word, lining it up with scripture, what's Paul saying? Don't be deceived. God will give you insight. We don't need to know every single word in every single book, but right? it's amazing when we, we get into his word, it just starts illuminating, uh, and, and all of a sudden, the person who needed that counsel, it was in that scripture you read that morning. And you're like, wow, Lord, that was not me. I don't know what I just said, but they were thankful I said that. I, don't, I can't even remember what I told them, but thank you, Lord, that you did that. And he will bring the right people around, and you, we've seen it, right? Verse 15, it says, And from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy had been taught about the Lord from an early age. Paul mentions his grandmother, Lois, and mother Eunice from being one that knew the Lord first. It's most likely that they raised Timothy to know the Lord. We see our children, we see our kids being deceived. We are to pour into the next generation. Where does it pour into those? These kids can... They may not get everything right in the Bible, but they surely can be instructed in the, in the principles of knowing God. Then part of 15, it says, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, the gospel. It starts with the scriptures, knowing what they say about salvation. If you want to understand salvation better, you need to read the scriptures, right? Good place to start is Gospel of John. There's many places to start, but that's a great, great place. The Gospel of John. I, I kind of lead people, just read Gospel of John, you know, and just read it. Don't try to understand it all. Just read it. Let the Lord open your eyes, your heart. It's through the scriptures that we learn that we are sinners. It's through the scriptures that we learn that our sin brings us a separation between us and God. It's through the scriptures that we learn that God has provided a remedy to take care of our sin. God loved us so much that he allowed his only son to become a sacrifice and to pay the penalty for our sin. What a blessing. What a blessing. In verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration to God. This is our verse last week. Paul doesn't say some scripture is given by inspiration, but he says all Scripture, all Scripture is given. Second Peter one twenty one says, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy man of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 
How can I know that God is behind this book and not just a bunch of crazy fanatic people, right? One of the greatest facts that, that attests to the scriptures as being inspired by God is that uh, the fulfilled prophecy. One of the greatest areas of fulfilled prophecy is to do with the coming of the Messiah. There are over 300 specific prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the first coming of Jesus. To name a few, number one, being born in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2. Two, two pre preceded by a messenger, Isaiah 40, verse 3. Number three, entering Jerusalem on a donkey, Zechariah 9.9. 9. Four, betrayed by a friend, Psalm 41.9. Five, sold for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah 11.12. Six, money thrown in the temple, buying a potter's field, Zechariah 11.13. Number seven, done before accusers, Isaiah 53.7. Number eight, hands and feet pierced. Crucified with thieves, Psalm twenty-two, sixteen, and Isaiah fifty-three, twelve. In an article, Stoners says the grass of the size of this number. Suppose you, uh, we take a hundred trillion silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas. They will cover all of the state, two feet deep. Now mark one of the silver dollars and stir the whole mass thoroughly all over the state. Blindfold a man and tell him that he can travel as far as he wished, but he must pick up one silver dollar and say that this is the right one. What's the chances he would have getting the right one? Just the same chance that the, the, the prophets would have had of this writing, these eight prophecies of having them all come true in any one man from their day to present time, providing they wrote them in their own wisdom. But we got to keep in mind that this was only eight of the prophecies. Don't forget that there are over 300 prophecies concerning Jesus. The end of uh, verse 16, it says, and, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Doctrine, meaning the instruction, the teaching, to teach you about God, to teach you about life, God's word. We see the word reproof. This is a proof that by, by which a thing can be proved or tested to convict you of our sin, right? It's to, be, to reproof. The correction is to straighten you up to an upright state. Improvement of life or character the instruction, the whole training and education of a children to grow you up. This is what the word of God, it's powerful. It's used for everything in life. And verse 17 says that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. God wants us to be equipped with exactly what we need for what's up ahead. It happens through his word. Through his word, God has these good deeds. He's equipping us. He's prepared in advance for us to do, and we just have to be ready for them. So as we close, the basics in life, the basic things that are so easy on paper, but sometimes so hard to get right. And so as we leave today, what does that look like in our life physically? What does a basic look like spiritually? How can we apply the basics of not just knowing, because we know, we know a lot about what God's word says. We know a lot about our fitness goals and our fitness walk, but are they matching up with what we are saying, what we want to do? Fitness is so broad. What do you want? What do you want to get out of it? And is, are your actions lining up with the things that you're voicing? Have people hold you accountable? Have God, more importantly, instruct you in the next steps. Doing the simple, we say, performing the common uncommonly well, which is state to the basics. Let's pray.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you made the gospel. We made it so easy. And we're knuckleheads. I'm talking to myself that we mess it up. But Lord, you give a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh chances and chances and chances. Your grace is sufficient. So Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for dying for us, that we would have life. Lord, and the, the broken world out there, Lord, help us share this life. Help us be mouthpieces for you, ambassadors for you, that we would share Jesus with those who are dying away, starting with the loved ones in our homes, our family, the close ones that you'd put on our heart, that we wouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. We would just preach the gospel. The days are, are close. Life is about a vapor. It's here and here we go. We're, it's gone. So help us be efficient in, in the things you're instructing us to do the short time on earth. And, and we thank you for the fitness piece that you've given this, this bridge uh, to just share the gospel with other people. There's many ways, but we thank you for the fitness piece that we are able to, uh, to build relationship with this, this piece. So we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Peace.